for our spine show, The Vertible Views. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Peter Newton, who will be talking on the art of anterior spine scoliosis correction surgery and what it bring. Dr. Newton is the celebrated scoliosis surgeon as in his best interests are in pediatric complex deformity surgery. Dr. Peter Newton is the chief of the DVD division of the orthopedics and scoliosis, as well as surgeon in chief at the Radio Children Hospital, San Diego. He also has affiliations as a clinical professor at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. Dr. Newton is involved in more than 350 peer reviewed high impact publications, which are shaping the spine surgery. Dr. Newton was the past president of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, as well as the prestigious Scoliosis Research Society. In addition to the clinical practice, Dr. Newton enjoys traveling, fishing, and auto mechanics. Apart from that, Dr. Newton loves his sharing his knowledge and teaching his young residents, fellows, and spine surgeons and shaping their career. We feel very much blessed, thankful, and grateful as Dr. Newton sharing his time with us. Over to you, Dr. Newton. Great. Thanks so much, Raj. I'll, uh, looking forward uh, to sharing with you uh, thoughts and, uh, and topics or on the topic of anterior scoliosis uh, surgery. I uh, really appreciate the anterior approach. Uh, it's obviously uh, maybe fallen out of favor over the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 years, but uh, I think it's still a powerful tool and one that we should uh, keep in our bag of tricks as we uh, consider particularly the pediatric uh, spinal deformity uh, patient. So I do have some disclosures uh, and many of them are relevant. I've, I've got IP around both posterior instrumentation, which uh, I guess might make me not a very good anterior advocate, but I've also got some IP around uh, tethering. And uh, I did some design work in the past on some anterior systems uh, for fusion as well. Well, I wanted to just take you through the, the anterior approach and why uh, I got uh, excited about it. This is uh, sort of a classic thoracoabdominal approach. Uh, the chest is to the left, the feet are to the right. And uh, these marking stitches are going in the diaphragm as we've divided the diaphragm. So we've got uh, the chest uh, open as well as uh, getting into the retroperitoneum. This is, uh, I think, really uh, a spectacular approach. This uh, is something I use in some of my larger uh, neuromuscular curves as, as well. I'll show you in uh, even idiopathic scoliosis still. Uh, but this is the exposure of the spine that is uh, is possible for, for a big curve. Uh, all those discs just waiting to uh, be taken out. Uh, and in doing so, you can really have uh, a beautiful exposure right back to the PLL. And uh, in visiting Professor Harms, he taught me how to take the PLL out uh, by getting uh, just into the uh, foramen on the, on the near side and then working across to, to get the PLL completely excised. And this makes just a spectacular amount of flexibility. You might uh, get a little epidural bleeding on occasion as well, but uh, uh, a little gel foam and, uh, and that'll be okay. So uh, in this scenario, I'm now planning on where uh, I'll put screws to do an instrument instrumented correction for this and using the bow, we just to kind of mark uh, what, what my screw trajectories might be. And in, in this scenario, we often try to cheat those screws a little bit posteriorly at the uh, apex to try to get a little more a uh, derotation effect. A pronged washer or staple is, I think, really helpful in keeping that screw from plowing when you do some compression. But uh, here's after the screws have been placed uh, in this particular patient, and we'll go ahead and uh, approximate the rod and do some segmental compression. And again, uh, this was a, a neuromuscular patient in which uh, we don't really need a whole lot of sagittal plane contour, but uh, we can really make a spectacular correction of a big curve through an anterior approach. So uh, that's the, the uh, that, that case, I, I hope just sort of sets the stage for some of the things that we might be able to consider. The anterior approach can appro of course be done open as you just saw there, very extensile a mini open approach, or in fact, thoracoscopic. And I 
kind of got my start uh, early in, in spine surgery related to thoracoscopic surgery and did a lot of work with anterior release, thoracoscopic anterior instrumented fusion, and now uh, thoracoscopic uh, tethering. But it's also, as I just demonstrated to you, uh, a, a beautiful uh, method to perform discectomy, make the spine flexible, and, and we'll talk more about the shortening the anterior column, but I think that's a, a really critical piece to why the anterior approach still has a role. It allows us to shorten the anterior column, uh, uh, and that uh, is a lot of the deformity present in, in scoliosis. Uh, of course, we can also instrument, and that instrumentation can be for fusion, uh, or now uh, commonly also for, for growth modulation in the form of uh, tethering, where we're really trying to limit the growth of one side versus the other side of the spine to, to power the correction of scoliosis. Let me show you another case. And uh, as you look at this patient, maybe you can, in your own mind, try to determine what you think the right treatment would be. It's a 12, uh, almost 13-year-old female. Versus zero, trigeminal cartilage is closed, but still got a lot of growth potential, big thoracolumbar lumbar curve. Uh, where and how are you going to stop your fusion? What levels? Is it going to be anterior? Is it going to be posterior? Is it going to be a combined approach? What are you thinking? Um, uh, the curve is uh, not particularly flexible. Uh, still a 50 degree curve on side bending. Sanders seven, in my mind, that'd be too old for any sort of growth modulation and, and probably too big of a curve anyway. Um, but again, big trunk shift, uh, L3, four disc is wedged open to the right, uh, with the apex at T12. And in that scenario, for me, that still means I can potentially stop this at L3, even though that seems like it's so far off midline, whether or not you'd be happy with that from a posterior approach or not, I'm not sure, but I did this anteriorly and it's the bigger thoracal lumbar curves that I, I still go back to the anterior approach. We use some inner body uh, support to main, make sure we've got lordosis maintained in that uh, a mid lumbar spine. And then, uh, but this is uh, the x-ray of that patient afterwards with just six levels instrumented, five discs. And uh, I just can't accomplish that uh, by a posterior approach. And uh, so I think there are scenarios where the anterior is superior to the posterior approach. I think this is one of them. Um, most of the time, you know, we can do this same operation from the back over the same levels, but not with a curve of that size, I don't think. So anyway, uh, one, of the, one of the points that I would like to make uh, about scoliosis and, uh, and why the anterior column uh, treatment might be appropriate is that the anterior column is too long in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. I think we've got some good evidence to that. I'll share that with you. And it's also true in most neuromuscular scoliosis as well. And it's very, very difficult to see what's going on in the sagittal plane uh, in 2D. Uh, I want to share some 3D data with you to help you appreciate that uh, difference. And, and we know that idiopathic scoliosis progression is associated with a loss of thoracic kyphosis and too much thoracolumbar and lumbar lordosis. So uh, again, if we take a three-dimensional model, project it just as we would see on the X-ray, you know, we, we can measure the Cobb angle, uh, as you see on those green lines, and we measure kyphosis from T5 to T12, as I show you here. But when you see that 3D, you appreciate how much those N vertebra are not really uh, in the correct plane to make an accurate measurement of what's going on. If we take those that standard lateral projection, segment each pair of vertebra, you can see there, I mean, some of them were looking end on, some of them were looking directly lateral, and we can make a, a reasonable assessment of what the flexion extension is, although it's rotated out of plane. But a lot of these levels, it's just nearly impossible to tell how much flexion or extension exists. And it's really flexion and extension that defines kyphosis and lordosis. Uh, and so how do we look at that a little differently? Well, we've uh, done some work to define the three-dimensional deformity that exists between any two vertebra and really look at it in the local reference frame of those vertebra. And this segmental analysis is meant to complement the global analysis. But here we've taken each of those same pairs of vertebra and turned them into a direct lateral projection of each vertebra rather than the position that they were in in, in the scoliosis. Just look at each, each pair directly from the side. And we put some vectors on there to kind of give you the, the normal vectors to the end plates or to the mid body. And you can see that uh, there isn't a kyphotic one uh, 
in this spine. And that was a big curve. But between T5 and T12, they're all lordotic. So we've got uh, uh, segmental lordosis at every level that if we want to create kyphosis, we're going to have to fix. And depending on how big that lordosis is, it may mean that we need to take the disc out to uh, make that corrected. Here's the other way that we visualize this. We take those standard uh, AP and lateral projections. And for the lateral, we derotate each vertebra and stack it in the same amount of lordosis or kyphosis that it, that it exists, but we untwist it uh, and take out the coronal deformity. And then that's the virtual segmental sagittal plane view that we see. Uh, and then you get a real sense of what that sagittal plane deformity is. Can you fix that all from the back with posterior column lengthening? Uh, and shortening and just squishing the disc down. Yeah, a lot of times we can, that's that's all we need. But other times it's too severe and we've got to take out the disc to make that happen. Here's the paper uh, that we wrote uh, a number of years ago, comparing this stack segmental view, again, kind of unmasking the lordosis that's present at these levels. That's just not visible when we take a straight uh, lateral uh, radiograph. We've really got to look at it uh, more directly at each segment to, to appreciate this difference. Uh, and that really opened my eyes to the amount of lordosis that exists uh, in idiopathic scoliosis. Here's a little bit more data uh, showing that this is the Cobb angle on the uh, x-axis and the 3D kyphosis, this, this kind of uh, measurement of kyphosis from 5 to 12 when it's been untwisted. And you can see when there's no deformity, the normal kyphosis range is, you know, 20 to 45 degrees. That's pretty typical. As the scoliosis progresses, you can see that there's less and less kyphosis present, such that when we get around 60 degrees, 65 degrees, in fact, we're flipping into thoracic lordosis. And again, we, we should be running, you know, in that uh, 30 degree range for thoracic kyphosis. And uh, and that should be our target range. Again, it should be probably patient specific and based on lots of things. But we've we've looked at this profile in thoracic versus lumbar curves, and uh, and we find that in fact there is a loss of thoracic kyphosis in both of these curves. Uh, probably fifteen to twenty five degrees loss of kyphosis, and uh, in the lanky five curves, we find them to be more lordotic than the controls in the periapical region. That means we've got more length there than we need. And so we can afford to do some shortening, whether that's with a tether or whether that's with discectomy. Uh, but one way or another, we've got to add posterior length and take away anterior length uh, to correct the deformity in all three planes. Again, here you can see that it appears to be kyphotic at the thoracolumbar junction. We often see that. But in fact, if you really look at it in 3D, it's not. But uh, again, you've got to have some appreciation for that. And again, if you do it anteriorly, we can certainly reconstruct uh, the anterior column where we need to and shorten it where we uh, also need to. Let's look at a big curve like this. Uh, if, if we don't have uh, a three-dimensional reconstruction, uh, the patient looks like there's substantial thoracic kyphosis. Uh, and globally, the patient is reasonably balanced. But if we go and make the, an estimated uh, kyphosis measurement, and we've got a formula published that allows you to do that, this comes out to be 32 degrees of lordosis between T5 and T12. That's an enormous amount of change in sagittal profile. We've got to make a 60 degree swing in the sagittal plane. I can't accomplish that from the back without taking some discs out. So uh, again, here's the, even if you think you got enough flexibility for the coronal correction, there's no chance, I don't think, to uh, create that much kyphosis. So here's where we bring in a thoracoscopic anterior release. Uh, again, a very powerful tool to get disc flexibility. Remove the disc. This is just a plif shaver in the disc showing the uh, flexibility that we can create. And when we pull that out, of course, we can shorten that anterior column substantially. This is the uh, correction after uh, anterior release. And again, we don't have perfect derotation. Not all those screws are, are exactly straight ahead. And those rods aren't perfectly superimposed on the lateral. But, but boy, we've gotten pretty darn close. And those, that's now an accurate measurement of thoracic kyphosis because we have done that derotation and brought that curve coronally nice and straight so we can make a, a good measurement. And we've made 
nearly that 60 degree swing in, uh, in T5 to T12 kyphosis that we were shooting for. So in, uh, with regards to just correction principles, uh, I, I believe that it's really important to define this three-dimensional shape uh, be, so that we can design an appropriate correction strategy. And the sagittal plane kyphosis correction can really be one of the most challenging parts of scoliosis correction. Uh, I think that's the area where we tend to struggle the most. Coronal's easy, sagittal's hard, derotation and kyphosis creation are, are tough together, but you can do one or, uh, one or the other, uh, but doing both of those together is the challenge. And, uh, and there's really a, a proper rod shape material in diameter that will allow you to, to create the force uh, required to get that spine corrected. And, and obviously that's a, it, your, your screw fixation or hook or wire fixation is also going to be important because you can only pull so hard before you pull out all your implants. But um, uh, that I think is uh, critical as we try to standardize what we're doing. And there, there is, I hope I'm making the case for you, uh, a role for anterior release in some of these more severe cases. Uh, posterior release tends to be uh, a relatively standard part of my operation for uh, anything more than just moderate scoliosis. Um, and it's, it's probably these more severe cases that require an anterior release uh, as well. But, but do the posterior column lengthening uh, in nearly the majority and uh, the anterior column shortening uh, probably in, in is much less uh, commonly required, but we're trying to to work on uh, some analyses right now to really define when that anterior release is, is indicated because I still am just guessing most of the time to be quite frank with you. So uh, the next key point is that anterior shortening in addition to posterior lengthening is needed for larger curves. Uh, and so the the anterior approach is the method by which we do that. And to get both derotation and sagittal restoration, uh, it often requires that anterior column to be shortened uh, and you just can't get enough from posterior alone. So uh, if we talk about vertebral column resection, this is you know the, the ultimate in anterior column shortening, if you will. Uh, and obviously we use it for largely for sharp angular deformities or if we need to decompress a neurologic deficit, or it's really rigid from a prior fusion. It's of course technically demanding, and I would say extremely rare in primary uh, virgin AIS cases. But again, it, it's, an, it's effective because uh, we get that shortening. What about um, in early onset scoliosis? We talked about idiopathic scoliosis. Um, you know, most of the time in early onset scoliosis, we're doing our best just to delay any operative treatment. But if you must, uh, then I would like you to consider the potential advantages of an anterior approach in early onset scoliosis as well. Uh, I'll show you uh, this case example. Uh, this is a, a little three-year-old with paraplegia secondary to a neuroblastoma excision. So that curve at the age of three uh, is, is really fought, fraught with trouble, right? I and mean, this guy is insensate, casting is a challenge. Uh, growing rods at age three is uh, going to require many, many, many revisions and a, and a very challenging posterior spinal re, uh, ultimate fusion later. This, this boy had one operation uh, in 2001 at the age of three and 15 years later, that's the only operation he needed because we took care of his curve primarily anteriorly. We got a good solid fusion and allowed his chest to grow. I mean, we, we still fused whatever that is, six levels, seven vertebrae, six discs. Um, but we got the height out of his chest that we required. Uh, we shortened his trunk a touch, but he had a single operation. And even if this fails five, six, eight years later, we now have a very straightforward posterior uh, final fusion operation. So I, I really try to stay out of the uh, posterior spine if I can. And when a short curve can be managed anteriorly, I'll take this uh, opportunity. Here's another example, five-year-old with a progressive neurofibromatosis curve short little fusion, all he's ever needed. Uh, so again, don't uh, don't get suckered into to doing a growing rod or something else that's gonna make a much longer area of disease from our from our quote growth friendly procedure. If we can limit the, the treatment area anteriorly to a very short segment, consider that. Here's that uh, little construct. Even, even uh, when it's not definitive, this is a, a girl, another neurofibromatosis patient uh, done thoracically. 
Um, you know, again, uh, this looks pretty good. It started to fall apart after a couple of years and a couple of years later, it really looks bad. But remember, we've just gotten five years out of a single operation and her final fusion is done uh, without having to go through any revision, scar, remove growing rods, deal with uh, a muscle that's been all beat up. And so uh, again, not much to work with in the way of pedicles because of neurofibromatosis, another reason why the anterior approach can be an advantage. Uh, but uh, again, don't uh, don't throw this away. This is really uh, spectacular. So uh, anterior in, in EOS, if you've got a short curve, it can be stage one. Uh, and if, if you're really lucky, it can be uh, definitive. And that apical correction with poor pedicles, bad posterior skin, and means a lower infection risk as well. So think about that in the myelo population as well. Anterior release in the young uh, and in the severe and for a few of these early onset kids, uh, maybe the juvenile version, we can even consider tethering. So I'm gonna switch gears into tethering because I know that's a hot topic these days uh, to talk about. Uh, the hope here is that we've created a method of scoliosis correction in which we maintain motion. And this idea of motion preservation obviously is uh, is huge. We've we're, we're sacrificing motion with all of our other fusion techniques. And can we not just get along, get into the same area as all of our joint surgeons and be motion preserving? Um, I think we can in some cases. I'll try to give you my thoughts on where we're successful and where we still have room to, to improve. The concept here is that we put these screws in and the connection between those screws is a, is a rope or a cord that you can't see on x-ray uh, that is tethering the growth on the convex side, allowing concave growth to occur. We grow the vertebra into a new shape. And because we've grown into a new shape, we're no longer dependent on the cord uh, at maturity. And you know, between two and the next 20 plus years, who knows what, uh, that spine will just be just like that. Uh, well, of course, we don't have 20 year follow-up to tell you that yet, but uh, that's our hope. So uh, at least in the United States, the FDA approved this tether in 2019 for skeletally immature patients. Uh, in my view, this makes no sense in anybody who's not growing, uh, despite some of my colleagues uh, who uh, try it. It's um, set up for curves 30 to 65. I don't think you need to tether a 30 degree curve when you can just put a brace on. So again, these this should be, in my mind, used for patients who have operative curves, uh, for fusion, but we're gonna, uh, a very select group who would otherwise be fused, we'll consider for tether. And, and really uh, this does have some spectacular potential. I mean, uh, again, that, that, that spine on the right is not absolutely perfectly straight, but it's, it's certainly, you know, for a patient who had open triradiate cartilage and a curve of that magnitude to grow that spine straight, I think this series demonstrates that yes, it can be successful, and yes, we can modulate the growth of the spine, right? I mean, we can, the, the, those screw angles changed over time and the spine got straighter. Uh, it's also true that the tether broke in there and we'll talk more about uh, you know, how you might see that. But this patient uh, you know, clearly has maintained flexibility and gotten good correction as a result of a tether. Now, I can't make this happen in every patient that I treat this way, unfortunately, and that's, the, that's been our challenge. Uh, we do have a fair bit of animal data to demonstrate that uh, this is a viable technique. We know the mechanisms. Uh, we've looked at the disc. The disc tolerates this extremely well, at least in animal models, uh, where the motion is maintained. Uh, and we've got histologic data and uh, 3T MRI data uh, and, uh, and gross data on these uh, animal models. And, uh, you know, again, demonstrating preclinically that we were able to modulate growth and demonstrate the disc could be preserved and healthy, both biochemically and, and histologically, was important uh, steps before beginning this clinically. Uh, and I presented, this was one of my very first uh, abstracts that I amassed on this top. I think this was the first one on this topic in 2001. So we're now over 20 years out from that early paper on a a bovine model uh, looking at a, at a cable system rather than a rod. That was a flexible stainless cable uh, that we used. And we could grow these calf spines from straight to very scoliotic in a, in a quick period of time. 
Uh, we became a little more sophisticated as the years went on and uh, used this implant system, which was designed specifically for tether and did a sham group in which we put the screws and the, and the staple in without a tether. And then we did another group where we put the tether in uh, six months survival. And again, uh, the discs look uh, no different between those that were uh, tethered versus the controls, other than there was a little shift of the nucleus in the tethered ones. But otherwise, hydration, spectacular. Uh, and really, that was probably the first that the area where I was most concerned. We'd tether these and kill the disc, and there'd be no point in, in trying to do a motion preservation with, with taking the disc out. Uh, he Kit Wong took that system uh, in, a, in a pilot trial uh, in Singapore and uh, published uh, his four-year outcomes in these papers. Here's one example where a pretty small pre-op curve, but you can definitely see over time there was growth modulation uh, in this patient. And uh, here's my first case. I did this in 2011, I think it was. Uh, 10-year-old boy, you can see that my phase of optimism lasted all the way to his four-year follow-up. And then at six years, he was still growing a little bit and his tether broke and his curve added on and it overcorrected at the top. And I revised him, extended the, the tether, took out some, the proximal curve continued to progress and he still ended up having a fusion. Maybe not as long as he might've had. And you know, who knows, maybe this was still, but he still had three operations to get to this point. So uh, yeah, it looked really good for a while. And I guess the other point of this is, you know, long-term follow-up in this tether is gonna be really important. We did look back at our uh, early experience uh, at two to four years in the in a JBJS paper in 2018, um, and yeah, clinical success was just in 59% of patients. This is, you know, maybe was the first time that tethering got a little bit of a uh, damp cloth thrown on it, or maybe just even a whole pail of water to cool things off a bit. But um, I I also think that we demonstrated in some of these cases that that there's something here to listen to and to pay attention to. But we converted four of that initial series uh, to fusion and six others had revision, four of them for overcorrection, which again, sometimes gets criticized. But I would say that if you've got overcorrection, you've proven that you've got a technique that can work. We may not know when to do it. We've at least got proof that we've got a technique that can powerfully correct scoliosis. So I, to me, that was encouraging news, not, not discouraging. Uh, he could finally, or not finally, uh, did go ahead and publish his series um, uh, with four-year follow-up, uh, and I uh, showed you that first picture, so it was really good in some, and and others was quite problematic, and uh, you can see that there was growth modulation, but overcorrection, then this adding on underneath, and we kind of moved a thoracic curve to a thoracal lumbar curve. Uh, Dan Hornschmeyer published a paper the following year looking at his two to five-year outcomes, a little older cohort. He had almost half his patients, Sanders 5 or older. Uh, I don't think I've done a tether on a Sanders 5 or older patient. 21% uh, revision rate, higher success rate than, than I had reported. And similarly, had some really good results and, and had some that failed relatively miserably and went on to fusion. But, uh, and this has sort of been the story. And so what is it that makes this um, not the reliable operation that we want it to be? I think one of them is, uh, you know, our, our ability to predict remaining growth. This is uh, Jim Sanders' work looking at uh, at how much growth is, is related, percent of, of final height uh, relative to peak growth uh, acceleration phase. And you can see that the Sanders scores are superimposed there. There's enormous variation uh, between a Sanders two. I mean, it's, it's a two-year difference between the oldest and the youngest Sanders twos. And there's probably the same, uh, at least a year uh, difference uh, in the three A's. And the three B's, maybe it's just a year. The fours are extremely narrow, but a short phase. And, and once you get to that point, four, five, and six, you, you don't have a lot of growth left to modulate. So my, my personal preference now is to work with the twos and the three A's as my kind of primary folks. But of course, there are some three B's that, that are right up there next to, to twos. So there's such variation in this, we're, we're not able to accurately predict based on standard score growth remaining. I think that's one of our biggest challenges right now with this technique. Roughly speaking, standards two patients have at least two or three years to grow. The threes, I'm, I'm now dividing into three A and three B. I think that turns out to be pretty critical. And the fours and the fives, I don't know if you can get enough in a year to, to make meaningful difference if you've got a curve big enough to operate on. I think that's that's one of our challenges. 
uh, we've I think we've got pretty good data to, that shows that that the change in the angle of the screws per segment per month correlates with the remaining growth. So uh, you get a bigger change when your uh, height velocity is high, and as your growth slows down, the the amount of change that occurs slows down as well. So that's just showing that it's growth related. Again, if we look at the change in the in the angle between the screws of a tether construct, this is uh, harm study group non fusion uh, study group data. The standard scores are, as you see down there, the, the sevens on the top of the graph, the ones on the bottom. And this angular change between screws over a two year period of time is what you're seeing plotted. Uh, first direct six months, 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months. So you can see the Sanders one, they're going on average five and a half degrees per level in the first two years. So you, you tether uh, six levels, you got 30 plus degrees of correction. So if you if you corrected the patient to 10 or 15 degrees, you're going to overcorrect immensely. So leaving how much deformity you leave on the table at the time should be based on the Sanders score. And you again, you can see beautiful potential in the Sanders 2 and the 3 A's. The 3 B's, 4's, and 5's actually lumped all together in this analysis. I, I think we probably just don't have enough discrimination yet to figure that out. But that's an interesting finding that. There wasn't a lot of difference between those. And I think that's partly why I've sort of landed on the, the twos and the threes is kind of the sweet spot, a three to four degree per level correction over the next two years. Um, you know, again, with a six or seven level construct gives you a pretty reasonable amount of correction potential. But two, one, two degrees per level, uh, I don't know if that's worth the squeeze. So uh, again, uh, roughly five plus degrees uh, per level, in Sanders one, four, two and a half, uh, and you can see the the variation as we go down, and and certainly in the Sanders six and sevens, we don't see much of anything happening. Uh, but again, it's highly variable even within each Sanders grade, and so uh, not every two goes at four degrees, and not every three goes at two and a half degrees. That's what's that's what's giving it, making this hard for us right now. But when we look at the three dimensional data of the the vertebra itself, we can clearly see three-dimensional change in the shape of the vertebra and the disc. We've done this uh, analysis uh, over time on, on multiple levels. Uh, here's uh, just a short little pilot study that we did initially looking at seven patients who did show progressive correction. And this is looking at the left side of the vertebral body and disc and compared to the right side. And the right side is where the tether went. And you can see that the right side doesn't get any longer. That's because we've tethered it. That's the goal to prevent growth on the convex side. The concave side on the other, other hand, progressively increases in length until at two years, it matches that of the convex side. That's what we would hope. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this was a series of 14 patients we had the data on. In seven, this happened. In the other seven, it didn't. So why some and not others is, uh, again, part of the question that we need to answer. But clearly in some of these patients, we're absolutely modulating the growth, allowing the concave side to catch up and for the lengths to become symmetric. I mean, that's our goal. Uh, we've got a bigger data set now from HARMS, uh, 50 patients with uh, similar 3D uh, measurement data. And uh, again, kind of a, a range of patients, Sanders two to four, typical kind of scoliosis, AIS sort of uh, uh, curves. Average height increase was eight centimeters. So clearly these patients were growing, but we have quite a bit of variation in that height gain as well. We made segmental anterior, posterior, right, left height measurements for both the vertebra and the discs. We threw out those in which we knew we had a broken tether. Here's the, the data on that bigger series. Again, the, the first post-op length to the two-year post-op length the right side basically doesn't change when we look at both the disc and, and the vertebra together. So that's what we expect. Don't, don't get any longer on the right side. Uh, left side, we see a very large differential growth. That's what we're shooting for. We didn't quite meet the data that, we, that I just showed you in that pilot data where we were able to get the height to match exactly on the right, but we, we certainly uh, approached it. Uh, and the, the growth between the right and left, plus 2.2 versus plus 1.7, highly different. Interestingly, anterior and posterior, we also saw growth. So these uh, were, were growing, the vertebrae are still growing, 
but were our main goal of, of creating differential growth right to left was where we were most successful. Here's to put it down, looking just at the disc height uh, on the side of the screw, the disc height decreases opposite the screw, the disc height increases. This is just the, the normal change in the wedging of the disc as uh, the vertebra shape uh, is restored. And on the vertebra, uh, again, we still are seeing growth throughout. And some of this growth is obviously at the expense of that disc that we just showed shrinking. But again, uh, very clear side to side difference in the uh, height of the vertebral height change uh, over that two years. So uh, this is, I mean, that's uh, this uh, image I'm showing you is, is actual image of a uh, three year change in the shape of the vertebra. Uh, for a kid that was tethered. So we can see it. Uh, we don't always see it. And uh, the concave vertebra can grow. The concave disc uh, tends to narrow. Convex disc tends to narrow. Uh, again, uh, not too surprising. If we do this too young, the patient will overcorrect. That's uh, one of the, the, the knocks on the technique. I, again, am not completely disappointed when I see this. I know that the tether is working. And uh, and if we need to take it out because we've got 100% correction, that is great. I let this one go a little too long before we pulled it, and uh, that leftward curve was, curve was maintained. But overall, her trunk shape is actually not too bad. We have now uh, uh, last year published on the harms experience of tether versus posterior spinal fusion. Uh, just to highlight uh, a couple of the uh, outcomes, they're not surprising at all. Uh, the, the post-op curve is smaller with a posterior spinal fusion. The, uh, the percent correction is greater with a posterior spinal fusion. The percentage of people who get to a curve under 35 degrees is, you know, nearly everybody in the posterior spinal fusion and just two thirds in the tether group. Um, and then the revision surgery rates are, of course, are uh, at this point, even at two years, uh, average 2.2 year follow-up, you know, five times higher uh, in the tether group. And that's still uh, not going to be the final. Uh, it's not the final for either, to be honest with you. That We know the 10-year revision rate for posterior spinal fusion is probably five, six, seven percent. But uh, the 10-year revision rate uh, for tether is going to be hmm, certainly above 20, uh, at least right now. Part of the reason is uh, we don't understand the growth I just mentioned. The other reason is that the cord uh, fails prematurely in many cases. And uh, if, the, if the cord makes it to three years, uh, we probably have completed most of the growth and it doesn't make much difference if the cord breaks. But if it breaks before two years when growth is still going, then we have a tendency for the curve to progress and, and this doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. Um, most of the papers have suggested that we're, we're breaking at least 50% of the time by around three years. Uh, and, and lumbar curves are probably higher. We've looked at just the, the outcome of uh, posterior spinal, uh, so no posterior spinal fusion and a curve less than 50 degrees. I mean, that's a pretty liberal definition of success. Um, and when we do that, you can see that at two years uh, in this kind of Kaplan-Meier curve, we're really looking good. We're still in the 90s. At four years, we're uh, we're down about to 90%. And then as we get to five years, we're dropping down to 65, 70%. So there's been some thought that we are, you know, learning. Uh, and a lot of this is the early experience. Again, we started this in 2011. And so if you look at that 2012 to 2015 experience versus the 2016 to 2018 experience, unfortunately, by four years, we're, we're still back down around that 70%, 30% failure rate. And again, this is just curves less than 50 degrees and no fusion. So um, we're, we're, we haven't learned that much uh, with regards to this, although uh, we're doing a little better on the early time frame in that first three years. So uh, we still got some work to do uh, with regards to long-term success. But again, I'll leave you with this x-ray just to, to show you the evolution over time of these curves. Uh, and boy, when we can get one uh, that looks like that, it makes you want to keep coming back and try again. The other thing that uh, uh, role that I think Tether may have a, uh, a spot is in these hybrid constructs where we've got uh, a double major curve where we just think a selective thoracic fusion is not gonna be sufficient. Uh, 55 degree curve in this patient just seemed a little too much. 
and uh, doing a selective thoracic fusion. I got to tell you, I'm doing these longer and longer. Uh, and in this case, I went uh, all the way down to two, one. What is that? Two, five, four, three, two, one. One, but well below, uh, nearly at the apex and well below stable. But again, if we do a beautiful job with that selective thoracic fusion, that tether only has to just sort of do a little bit of uh, holding and growth modulating for uh, a short period of time. Uh, and this may be where we have a, a role for tethering as well, uh, preserving lumbar motion uh, in double major curve. I'm, I'm optimistic about this. Uh, the data is early. We'll see where that goes. There are a lot of people uh, kind of looking into this uh, uh, possibility as well. So uh, anterior surgery for a lot of us is an acquisition of new skill. I got lucky enough to to be kind of raised on anterior surgery. And so uh, it's been been natural for me, but uh, I had to teach myself the endoscopic approach. And uh, the key there is just make sure you've got uh, good camera skills. You got to pick the ports in the right place and and get good hemostasis so you can see things. But, but thoracoscopic spine surgery is also a, a really valuable skill set to, to have. Uh, it, you might have to come to a few courses and train in some animals, but uh, it's also a good uh, a good skill to have. I think I'm going to stop right there, Raj. Uh, it's uh, we're about 40 minutes in and leave some time for questions. Uh, and uh, I can go back to this if we want to look at some more technical stuff about how to do tethering. But uh, let's let's uh, wrap it up there and see what kind of questions you have. Sure. So uh, going back to the one of the landmark articles you have, Dr. Newton, which we discussed earlier also, the retrospective study between uh, posterior fusion and the anterior vertebral body tethering. Uh, the, as a young surgeon, when we interpret the article, the results of the anterior vertebral body, not going much into the stat statistics, it says uh, the results are less, in con less consistent, less predictable with higher revision rates and more complications. So how you convince the families as well as the young surgeons to take uh, the anterior vertebral body tethering over the PSF? Yeah, you know, I, uh, it's a great point, and that's it, that really is uh, the message of the paper. Um, I guess I would say that um, I, I tell people that um, in the tether group, uh, a certain percentage are going to go on to fusion, um, but in the fusion group, they all go on to fusion. So uh, it depends on your perspective and whether or not you think motion and, and not doing a fusion is really, really important. Um, and some families value that motion uh, a lot. And, and to be honest with you, they probably value it. They probably overvalue it because they don't understand what motion uh, they're actually losing uh, because it isn't very much. And so trying to bring some sort of clear understanding to people what that mobility loss is, is very difficult because people hear fusion and they just want to not do it, and especially when they can go to the internet and um, and and be contaminated by uh, all sorts of nonsense that's presented there about the benefits and the, the and the tragedy of having a fusion. Um, again, I think thoracic fusion is a highly reliable operation. We've known that before. This this you know paper didn't make it make that uh, any different. And our uh, work on tether is, I think, becoming more reliable as we gain experience. But uh, you also can't be you can't be taken in by by two year outcomes. And even at this point, those are just two year outcomes, and it's still not even close to a posterior spinal fusion. But uh, I think when I have the conversation with families, I I really emphasize. Uh, uh, the reliability of a posterior spinal fusion, the uh, loss of motion will be modest. Uh, the reliability of a, a tether is not where we would like it. And there's a, there's a pretty high chance that you'll need a second surgery. But, you know, if you want to try to avoid a fusion, in some patients, it's reasonable. You've got to be growing. You've got to be growing quite a bit, in my view. You got to have a pretty flexible, moderate size curve. Um, I think the thoracics are the uh, places where we have the least to lose. Uh, and it it's not a bad place to start, to be honest. But I think a lot of people want primarily to preserve lumbar motion. Of course, I do as well. But I think that the tether is even 
harder to predict in the lumbar spine because it the growth is faster and harder to, to predict. We don't have as much data on lumbar. Um, and the tether fails more quickly in the lumbar region. And two tethers has not been the solution. Uh, they both break. Uh, maybe one breaks and then the second one breaks. So maybe you buy yourself a little bit of time, but not much. And I think until we've got a more reliable, uh, more durable cord that uh, I'm um, hesitant to do primary lumbar curves. I, it's not to say I don't. I just, just did one a couple of weeks ago, but um, I'm, I'm more hesitant on those, particularly in bigger patients and particularly in those patients who want the motion. They're going to go out and dance and do backflips and do all this crazy stuff that is going to rip that thing before it uh, before it's done its job. So I try to get people who want to do it to be small and commit to taking their life a little, little bit uh, on the slower side, which again, most of them don't want to hear. Uh, they're, they're having this operation because they want to go back to gymnastics and they think a fusion will stop them from doing that and Tether will allow them. So um, it's, a, it's a complicated space right now on how to talk to families because uh, they can read on the internet all sorts of things and um, uh, and there are obviously forums and uh, where they can get online and talk to other families and it's it, it really complicates your conversation with with the family as a new surgeon young surgeon in, getting interested in trying to do this um, you know I, I mean there's young surgeons um, uh, have the advantage of uh, you know they're 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 more skilled with some of the minimally invasive techniques. They might know how to run the camera better because they just finished their orthopedic training and can scope a knee and a shoulder and all sorts of things. And so they've got better scope skills than older surgeons. Um, but you also, as a younger surgeon, have a harder time with um, you know families, managing families in, in failure of the procedure. Uh, you don't have enough years of experience to have the credibility to you know, let people know this is what we expect and they know that you know that. And uh, so I think it's harder for younger surgeons to do operations, to comfortably do operations with a higher failure rate. I mean, just you're sort of setting yourself up. Um, so I don't think I would say this is the first uh, operation all young surgeons should go try to to master until we can be, help you be a little bit more predictable. Um, yeah, get your, get get comfortable doing the standard approach. Posterior spinal fusion is is a fabulous operation that, uh, you know, is, is as I said, is reliable uh, and, and reproducible and, and generates really great correction. And as we try to put that little cherry on the top and take away the fusion component and get that same correction, but maintain motion, we're asking a lot, you know, we're asking a lot because we've got a really good operation. We're trying to make uh, a, a little bit better and we're probably making people worse for a while until we can perfect it. But I, I know that the potential is there to do it. We just aren't smart enough yet to know who to pick uh, and and how tight to make it and what sort of correction uh, to do interoperatively, I think, are where we're still struggling. Understood. So just subset of the two questions on the pre previous question, if you have to put it in between the lines of the research, do you think um, whatever body tethering will be coming up uh, big in the future? And uh, secondly, do you think um, hybrid technique will have great uh, results in the future, like fusing the thoracic and just tethering the lumbar? Yeah, um, I remain optimistic for both approaches, although I, I fear in the development and the innovation in many of the things that we do in orthopedics and in medicine in general, we we commonly overutilize initially uh, and don't discern, we don't go slow enough to study it well enough to um, really know the answer before we go widespread. And sometimes that makes for a really rocky course. Uh, and I suspect the hybrid will do the same. Um, unfortunately, you can imagine that a scenario where every person who would have originally got a selective thoracic fusion and done beautifully will get a selective thoracic fusion plus a hybrid tether because they don't know if they need it or not. Well, that'll be terrible because we'll be, you know, doing all sorts of retroperitoneal surgery on people who don't need it. Um, so I fear that we could land in that scenario. So if we reserve it for the lanky six curve, 
and say, let's just start this in a patient who we know we can't do a selective thoracic fusion because they have a, they have a major lumbar curve, but there's enough of a thoracic curve that a selective thoracic fusion will drive 50 or 60% of the correction of the lumbar curve just by fixing the thoracic, especially if we go down a little bit longer than we typically would and grab the upper part of that curve. I feel like now if I get close to the apex, which is sort of crazy, right? Nobody goes to the apex. We can really derotate the apex and then we don't have our tether needing to do quite so much. So um, I think that we'll find a sweet spot. I, I got to tell you that most people who do tether, who do hybrid constructs right now, stop their constructs even shorter than for their th selective thoracic fusions because they want to do more non-fusion work. But now you're really dependent on that tether to do everything. And so I, I'm not, maybe I'm only a 50% hybrid. <laughs> I only want to, I only want to tether the bottom half of the lumbar curve. Uh, you know, L2, 3, and 4 are what were really important to save. Um, and if I fuse it to L1, who cares compared to T11? So take those extra levels, get it to L1. It'll make you a better selective thoracic fusion surgeon also, because you learn to grab the top of that lumbar curve and push it underneath you'll get a better selective thoracic fusion and you'll get a better spontaneous lumbar curve correction because you grab that top vertebra of the lumbar curve and put it back underneath. So I do think there's some things that will be advantageous to our fusion surgery by doing hybrid. Um, I, it's made me a better selective thoracic fusion surgeon. And um, so I'm optimistic, but I, I fear that the innovation cycle will, will go too far. We'll do too many of them and then we'll have to bring it back and hopefully find out what works and doesn't work. I think we're doing that in tether right now, to be honest with you, on, on both lumbar and thoracic. Some people have even swung already through that curve and said, I'm not doing thoracic anymore because it does. it's just not reliable enough and posterior spinal fusion is so good. The difference in motion is so small. I'm not gonna do it. Um, and I'm only gonna focus on lumbar. I mean, uh, how that swings uh, will be interesting to see. But I, I do think in the long term, this technique will have a role, but I don't think it'll be as big a role as we're seeing right now. I think we will hone down the indications and do fewer patients. And I don't, I personally don't think this is going to be much more than 20% of uh, idiopathic scoliosis surgery. Very well understood. So uh, lastly, uh, do you want to share anything about the technique, about the VBT, or uh, if you have time, that's the thing. Yeah, sure. Let me just go back and pop those slides up. We'll just talk a little bit about the technique because uh, if we've got, uh, yeah, we got eight minutes, let's just go do that. Let me start sharing again if I can figure out how to get back there. Good. Well, uh, again, the open surgical approach, we already showed a big case, uh, beautiful exposure. You got to know how to do this before you can do it endoscopically. But the thoracoscopic approach is really uh, elegant when it's done well. Single lung ventilation, three, four, five incisions, uh, open the pleura, divide the segmental vessels, get a beautiful exposure of the spine. Um, here's the view of the scope when you come in, a fan retractor, go down onto the lung that's been deflated. You can count down from uh, where you are. You can use some K-wires to figure out your angle. Uh, make sure you've got your levels correct. Open the pleura with a harmonic scalpel. This is an ultrasonic uh, device. It coagulates the, the vessels beautifully, so you can take those segmentals, use that blade to just dissect around the front. This is my typical portal setup for uh, somebody who's having instrumentation, one anterior portal uh, and three posterior uh, along the posterior axillary line. Uh, again, I put the surgeon and the assistant on the anterior side because the scope is coming anteriorly and looking from front to back. I want that video monitor in the same perspective as my eyes go to that monitor is that camera goes to the spine. So everybody looks in the same direction. This camera looks in the same direction as the eyes of the surgeon and the assistant to the video monitor. Putting someone on the opposite side and a monitor on the other side is all backwards and gets them upside down. They don't know what's going on. They can't help you. So put both people on the front side. Get the lung down well, either double lumen. Uh, that's my preferred if the patient's big enough and a bronchial blocker if they're too small for a double lumen. Uh, here's that tube. Positioning is critical. Axillary roll, 
Uh, you want the, the spine to hang down if you're going to do instrumentation. So you kind of make a little valley for that spine to straighten. Uh, I plan the ports uh, and the trajectory of every screw, uh, marking it on the fluoroscopy so I know where I'm going to go. That allows me to plan the portals. So again, if we're going to instrument 6 to 12, I put a port between 6 and 7, between 8 and 9, and then another one on 11 that I can do 10, 11, and 12 through that single skin incision. So I'll put two to three screws in per skin incision, jumping over or under the rib each time. Again, here's this scope holder is uh, spectacular. I use it primarily for the fan retractor. Here's some views inside the chest. This is kind of the first view I see when I come in. Diaphragm on the left, lung down low. Those bright white spots are the rib heads. You can see the segmental vessels uh, where the vertebrae are and the and kind of the in the valleys and the, the hills between of the disc. Uh, look and see where that portal is coming in distally. This is the inferior port coming in, uh, make sure you're above the diaphragm. You don't want to be in the retroperitoneum with this uh, in, uh, that port. Here's looking back up north. The lung hasn't completely collapsed, but you can see the ribs. We'll get a fan retractor. That's the fan retractor coming in that inferior port going on the scope holder. That can push the lung down. And now you get to see this beautiful azygous system, which of course you need to respect. That thing will uh, bleed like crazy if you get into it. So, uh, that big oblique vein across the spine is usually around T4. So fortunately, we don't have to deal with that very often. The first rib is usually not visible. We palpate that with a peanut. The second rib is usually the first rib you see. So don't get off on the count by calling that first obvious rib one. That's usually two. Uh, again, we showed this. Uh, I'll show you a little more of the harmonic uh, in action. This is the hook blade. This is kind of what's used today that they got rid of that other device. But uh, you can... Use the harmonic to open this pleura, really being slow and deliberate, coagulate all the little vessels that are in the pleura, everything over the top of the disc. Uh, that's a, a little sympathetic starting to come into view there as well. I don't, I don't mind taking those, uh, but we'll slowly coagulate, dissect down, coagulate those vessels, treat them soft, gentle, uh, and make sure they're fully, uh, uh, contracted uh, before you try to cut through them. Um, and if we're going to do an, an anterior a tether, we don't need a lot of exposure here. We just need enough exposure to get the staple in. We don't have to go circumferentially. When I do a, a discectomy, I pack a sponge around the front so that I can uh, get fully around the annulus without uh, risk to the to the great vessels. But that's the exposure when the segmental vessel once the segmentals have been taken down. Uh, and here's that same view. Again, if we're gonna do, um, uh, here's taking the diaphragm down. If you need to get to L1, you just kind of continue that incision right through the muscle. Um, but remember, if you can't see it, don't be biting around or doing stuff because there's a lot of important things inside that chest and uh, you've got to have really good visualization. Here's where those sponges are packed around the far side for discectomy. That gives you spectacular exposure to be able to get around. Now we're going to come back to just instrumenting for tether. That pronged washer went in and we check with fluoro to make sure we've got our screw depth. We want to get a bicortical uh, screw, but we don't want it, do not want excessive length. I just pulled screws out of somebody done uh, saying elsewhere today where they were about eight millimeters long and up against the aorta. So uh, we've got to really be careful. The aorta is, uh, is right there. So try to get your screws as parallel as possible, get bicortical fixation. Uh, but not excessively long. Uh, once you got that in, we'll we'll drop the cord in. This is a polyethylene uh, cord. Uh, we get it engaged into that top screw, uh, lock the set screw, and we'll perform sequential compression. And this is one of the big questions is how much compression or tension do you put in the cord? Uh, <laughs> it's another area where we don't have great answers, I hate to tell you. I mean, the the, the, the gist of it is, not so much at the ends and a lot in the middle, but that's not a very precise prescription for, for this. And so in general, we're trying to get the discs uh, nearly parallel, maybe even a little over compressed. You can see this compressor kind of uh, is squeezing down that. I push down with the device, tension, we're at the apex. We're trying to get as much, as much correction as we can uh, at the apex. So, um, Again, it's the same anatomy that you're always used to looking at, but uh, getting the lung down is absolutely critical. You gotta have good, perfect uh, positioning of both the patient and your portals. Uh, so make sure that you uh, can get that done. But uh, 
and uh, if you have to go back, uh, oh boy, uh, it can be a little bit ugly. There's a lot of adhesions uh, and, uh, and, and and trouble. I'm gonna, here's just kind of what you can be looking at if you try to go back again for another one. Plural adhesions everywhere. These are really, uh, can be nasty on the revision. So uh, I don't think we wanna go into too much detail there. And I think I'll, uh, uh, I think we're getting close to time. So I'll take it off there. <laughs> That's really wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Newton. We really thank you from Author TV and uh, all the viewers uh, for your sharing knowledge and teaching us. Thank you very much, Dr. Newton. No, it's my pleasure. And uh, uh, again, if you'd like to reach out, please do. And if you want to take a make a visit to San Diego, we're always uh, happy to see folks. And uh, we'd welcome you uh, at Radio Children's Hospital to spend some time with Mike Kelly and uh, Salil Upasani. Uh, and the rest of our, our team at Radio Children's. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Newton. Take care. Cheers. Have a good day, folks.